Hello, I'm Hugh Hayden. I'm a sculptor. I'm originally from Dallas, Texas, and I'm based here in Brooklyn, in East Williamsburg. I'm looking at this idea of the American dream and the difficulty in inhabiting that space. A big goal of mine is to sort of transform these things that I think a lot of people might take for granted. And if I can manipulate your perception of what a piece of wood or a tree can be to your own personal history, it's a way in to change even further conceptually how you think about the world. My whole practice is really involved in like the manipulation of like tangible materials that are familiar and that, you know, that, that to me are tied to real world experiences, but therefore also necessitate this handwork or like craft. When I was growing up, I, I loved gardening. And also we always lived kind of at the edge of a forest. So I was played outside outdoors with making like airplanes out of trees and palm tree fronds and stuff. So I, I've always had a natural affinity to use a lot of natural materials uh, with my goal of taking something from the natural world that's really ubiquitous, like a tree or a piece of wood and transforming it into something uncanny, different, something unexpected that might change the way you think about the world and the sort of more social issues that that object is being transformed into. And I'm really interested though in, you know, altering the way we think about these materials and wood that we interact with daily. Like, I think most people don't even think of a pencil anymore as a piece of wood and as, as like an extension of a tree. And so it's from a just a material perspective. You could think of the history of wood in America as always, you know, or lumber is always like this orthogonal rectilinear volume. And it's kind of ironic because, you know, trees are so organic and natural and curvy and sinuous and blah, blah, blah. Yet, in most people's lived experience, a piece of wood is this thing that's like straight. It, it, I also, I kind of sometimes compare the way I use wood, uh, like if you think of like a McDonald's chicken McNugget, is this like puree of like 20 chickens. It's like OSB plywood, it's, it's ori oriented strand board. Uh, a two by four common dimensional lumber is like a um, like a chicken breast strip. It's sort of been filleted, blah blah blah. It's still abstracted from a chicken. I mean, you know, it's chicken from being told it's chicken, and it you know resembles a single piece of meat. Versus, uh, and then you could say the way I use wood often is like a, a drumstick with the foot still on it. So you have a more of this idea of where it came from. And to me, leaving the foot on the piece of wood kind of brings in um, more of a like cultural history or, or other, other, other things that might be lost if you just serve like this, you know, puree. I've been 
using like the stumps of branches or transforming wood in different ways. And essentially it's a school desk made of wood that from salvaged Christmas trees where the branches have been cut back and transformed into pencils that have graphite like lead in them that has been sharpened so that vis visually, it, it, you know, it looks like pencils or organically almost in, stopped in motion growing out of the surface of the wood. But uh, a school desk that is covered in pencils, you know, you, there's like the material that we've transformed, there's the technical transformation, and then conceptually, you know, this formal thing. So then it, 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 the viewer can piece all these different things together from their own vantage point because they each have their own history that they're bringing to it. You know, as artists, I think we're kind of remixing history in the past and the current and the future to create these sort of new narratives or new ways of looking at things. And so for, at least for me, that's sort of, I'm trying to remix the way you think about history mixed with the natural world using these like wood and especially a lot of vernacular furniture forms, whether it's a school desk or Adirondack chair, which is this uh, sort of outdoor wooden lawn chair. And it, to me, it symbolizes a sort of notion of land ownership, relaxation, a second home, being outdoors, you know, just uh, a chance to sort of inhabit the American dream. But often some of the Adirondack chairs I make are, are very difficult to actually sit in. They might be slanted, they might have bristles on them, they have thorns on them, they have flames on them, you know, that bring a different sort of significance to it. The same with a school desk which for me sort of the stand in for education or the pursuit of education and sort of as this wave towards upward mobility. But at the same time, there are these different difficult things of inhabiting that space, whether it's cost of tuition or uh, some people don't do good in that sort of environment. I've always loved wearing camouflage clothing. And I often use camouflage and then the ability to blend into a natural landscape as this sort of metaphor for blending into this sort of cultural or social landscape. And so where one's ability to sort of blend in is sort of reflects your relationship to like, you know, ecological issues as well, but also sort of the social landscape. Hugh the Hunter is a short film I collaborated on with a friend of mine, Zach Heinzerling. And sort of in this short film, I'm, I'm the lord of the estate, sort of going on this surreal hunt for a grouse where I'm the grouse I'm hunting. I have this uncanny sort of blur between uh, into different types of camouflage, and myself included. The tweed of his coat matching precisely the pattern of the heather behind him, fitting into the landscape as had been learned from his forebears, generation to generation. And in that singular moment, Hugh and the grouse 
saw each other for what they were. The bird recognized Hugh as a fellow creature of camouflage. Oh, this is the last thing. The grouse, I pick it up. He and had it's... conquered the grouse. But something had changed within him. He now felt a sharp comprehension of the animal's deepest thoughts and feelings. Though what those thoughts were precisely is not for us to discern. I did not always know I was going to be an artist. I knew I was always a creatively like geared or inclined person, but I feel as if I grew up in a world where there were no living artists, even though I went to sort of really like strong academic programs. But in all those schools, whether it was my all boy Jesuit high school or my like talented and gifted middle school program where I went to the Dallas Museum of Art every Wednesday, uh, all the artists were dead and also these schools were really focused on academics and they wanted you to be like a doctor or a lawyer or a business person or a dentist. My brother who went to these same schools as a, as a lawyer in Los Angeles now. And, you know, it wasn't until after I graduated college and I was living in New York for a couple of years that I started to meet people who said they were an artist, that that was their full-time job. And, you know, that I interpreted their artistic output as a way of, of sharing your perspective and view of the world with the public. And up until that point, I didn't know there was an audience that was interested in some of the things I personally were interested in. Yeah, that was sort of how I came to becoming an artist because I realized I did have things to say, but I just didn't know there was a space. You know, I didn't really know there were museums or galleries in the sense that they were showing work that could have some more, like, uh, affected cultural dialogue. For architecture school in my undergraduate years, I ran a student publication called Awkward. It was sort of like a multi-format student publication that was a lifestyle magazine. But then it grew into like a, a more tactile object that uh, was sort of a visceral experience. And anyhow, one of the things that I always wanted to create uh, as a photo shoot was cornrowing the hair of a golden retriever. At that time, like a golden retriever to me symbolized this like notion of preppiness of like an Ivy League school and also like cornrows as sort of ha hairstyling technique had become very mainstream and popular on different, you know, athletes, musicians. It was really mainstream. And so I wanted to sort of subvert this sort of vernacular African-American hairstyling technique onto this animal that I thought also was like represented a specific type of Americanness. And, uh, and for me, that was about this idea of taking this uh, African-American vernacular hairstyling technique that could apply, be applied to virtually any type of hair, but it did for me come from a specific cultural place and applying it to this, uh, eventually to these animals that represent like North America, like a mountain goat or a buffalo. So I haven't, I don't go in here this much, but these are from when I first started making these artworks with hair, like where this was one with Michelle Obama that I called it a fading 
into these sheepskins. But this isn't the first thing. The, the first thing is this here. And it's, so I haven't made any more of those pieces. I mean, I, I still do want to braid the hair on that living dog, but it would probably be, um, the documentation would be a photo of it. Or another, like another idea is that I would raise this like standard poodle um, and show it, show it so it gets to be a champion. And then when it makes it to Westminster, I cornrow its hair and show it as a cornrow poodle at Westminster, which is like the highest form of uh, like a dog show in the US. In most of my pieces, the, the lighter ones are more skillfully made. But the first ones might be more carefully made. Just because, you know, once I feel like I've mastered it, I might actually take, try to do it faster. But I have my own, like, checks and balances for, like, craftsmanship. But, like, one of the reasons I have to do this myself, well, it's so, every move is subjective. But in the end, I think that me making these repetitive decisions on the same logic get, creates a certain continuity within the piece that it, that's legible, that it appears as one finished work, which for me is really important. Despite the amount of basketball pieces I've made, this piece that I'm working on is the genesis of how I got into making all of them in that, um, this, and this is the third peacock chair or base backboard. And essentially, uh, growing up, we had two of these chairs always in the kitchen. And then when it was my earliest memory is then like gradually they got more removed from the house and eventually they were thrown out. But I always thought that they looked like a basketball backboard. And I, and like once I became an artist, I still had that, those memories. And then as I got older, I knew about this chair and its associations to the Black Panthers. And there's a famous photo of Huey P. Newton, one of the founders of the Black Panthers, sitting in one of those chairs. With all of these basketball works that are woven, you know, there's this tension between this bravado and masculinity, but rendered in this sort of like delicate basket weaving, very fragile technique that is maybe has more feminine associations than masculine. And so there's a tension between the process and the technique and the materials that is still like a challenge, is, a, is challenging relative to those, those things. Before I made any wood carving, my artwork was really focused on these organs of identification, the things that visually make an organism different. So like hair, skin, feathers, bark, leaves, uh, they're all like organs that identify what the nature of something and why it's different maybe. And so with the uh, skeletons, I wanted to look for a common ground. For me, it's about, to some degree, anonymity and that a skeleton could be anyone. It could be any gender, it could be any ethnicity, any sexual orientation, any religion. You know, it, it's somewhat ambiguous who it is and sort of my representation of them is this idea of the sameness and sharedness amongst people and that it has an openness. In these recent interconnected hanger pieces, from an autobiographical perspective, I was in a relationship when I started making them. And I guess I was in love and sort of uh, thinking about this being connected to another person and sort of this sort of embrace, you know, and lockstep with someone else. And, you know, also I had an interest in exploring new ways of, of making a skeleton, like using wood, but in a new way. And essentially it became a process of learning how to do bent uh, wood lamination, which was like me learning French in terms of wood working goes. I, I don't speak French. There are so many bespoke parts to make them from scratch. The average person would have no idea what goes into making each of these elements. It's, it's all like a part, literally, and that it takes the whole studio to make them and that 
There were about five people involved in the process, including myself. I'm also working on these new works, which to some people are a departure, but I made these started, I made this one before I made any wood carvings, and it was sort of looking at somewhat a notion of phallic architecture where I made a cast of the um, Empire State Building and then gave it some hair and, and, and then rendered it in silicone to become this more flaccid thing. But so I'm exploring that further and making these different um, sort of like sort of phallic buildings that will essentially become like uh, for this show coming up uh, that will be sort of these will be these wall silicone works and so that's somewhat why I've had these different buildings around sort of looking at so these are kind of the early test but also beyond um, the Another one, this is like a, another piece that we're also working on where it's sort of like this mannequin bust, but it has this sort of gun. And so it's sort of still like figuring some stuff out with it, but it's sort of, I mean, it's kind of obvious. It's like the gun where the, it's like a Glock 19, and the, which is a common police gun and the sort of, you know, commentary on masculinity, gun violence and power dynamics and police brutality. I definitely think there's humor in my work. However, I think that's a reflection of reality and maybe these the objects I'm making it or distilling it into these experiences that you might get in layers or all at once. However, the conflation of something that's very desirable but also threatening can seem humorous, but also that's many aspects of, of living in America or a society that you're often conflated with all of these different things at once. And, you know, I guess in my work, I'm trying to distill these ideas. And so sometimes when seeing them at those states that I'm sort of crafting, it, it could come off as humorous or, or like, you know, uncomfortable laughing. But it's it's all about perspective because there's like different ways of, of approaching it. You know, like when you slip and fall or trip, it, it's like, oh my gosh, I don't want to hurt myself, but also some can be funny. Uh, so it, it's sort of, I think that is part of this sort of lived experience for many people. As artists, I don't want to close people out of even looking at it, uh, you know, and experiencing what I'm interested in. And so at least maybe the humor is lets people have more of a way in that they're less going to be closed off to and afraid of a new perspective. <laughs>